a seared conscience. True repentance must include a sense of shame combined with a humble and teachable spirit. Here once again is Gene Getz. The people of Judah were violating this principle. We see it and they had no sense of shame. They were prideful. They were not teachable. And we see this illustrated here in the book of Jeremiah. In fact, they had a seared conscience. And we read about that in chapter 6, verse 15. Were they ashamed when they acted so abhorrently? They weren't at all ashamed. They can no longer feel humiliation. Now that is a, a serious statement. When people come to the place that they no longer feel humiliation because of their sin, that's a line you don't want to cross because that's the ultimate and deterioration. That's a seared conscience. We read on, Therefore they will fall among the fallen, and when I punish them they will collapse, says the Lord. And so we see a seared conscience, but we also see something that is really quite relevant today in some situations because Judah continued to engage in religious rituals that related to the temple that related to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they syncretized all this with paganism and false gods. And we see this in uh, Jeremiah 6.20. What used to me is frankincense from Sheba or sweet cane from a distant land. By the way, the sweet cane there refers to an ingredient that was in the anointing oil that the priests used in the true worship of God. And so God is saying, that means nothing to me. Your burnt offerings are not acceptable. Your sacrifices do not please me. In other words, they were going through all of these rituals and thinking because they went through these rituals, they could get away with idolatry. They could get away with evil. They could get away with violation of all the commandments of God if they simply included God a little bit. And God said, what you're doing means nothing as far as worship of me is concerned. And as I thought about that, I thought about something that Paul wrote. And he lived, of course, during the Roman Empire. And in his first letter to Timothy, he states something that is pretty gripping. And I've called it demonic influence. And we read, Now the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. Now that means they knew the truth, but they suppressed the truth and they departed from the faith. Paying attention to deceitful spirits. Now these are strong words. Deceitful spirits. And the teachings of demons. I mean, this is evil. Through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. That sounds like Judah, doesn't it? You see the parallel. Now, what happened? Why did all of this take place? Well, read on. They forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods that God created to be received with gratitude by those who believe and know the truth. Now go back to the Roman Empire. Go back to the church that emerged within the Roman world. One of the first doctrines of evil that came in was to forbid marriage, that if you don't marry, particularly as a leader in the church, you're more holy than anybody else. That has led to the worst forms of immorality both heterosexually, homosexually, and pedophilia. Where does it come from? A doctrine of demons. Forbidding marriage, saying that you can be more holy if you don't have a sexual relationship, but it just led to more incredible sexual relationships that violated the will of God. That's a historical fact. Forbidding to eat certain foods. 
thinking that that will make you holy. But God said through Paul, for everything created by God is good, including, first of all, the sexual relationship that God designed for marriage, including food. Everything created by God is good, and nothing should be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, since it is sanctified by the Word of God in prayer. The doctrine of demons. And basically, you see that happening throughout biblical history. And it's creeped on into the religiosity of so-called Christianity. The doctrine of demons. That's an indictment. But it's true. And so we have the reflection and response question here. How does David's experience described in Psalm 51 illustrate positively the above principle from Jeremiah? Let's repeat that principle so you, you get it in front of you. True repentance must include a sense of shame combined with a humble and teachable spirit. Now think about David and his sin compared with Judah and her sin. Now David sinned, committed adultery, he committed murder. It was horrible. By the way, according to the law of the Old Testament, he should have died. But God had mercy on him. That's God's grace once again, even in the Old Testament. And here we see it in a psalm that he wrote. Look at these verses. This is a repentant heart. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That's brokenness. And God heard that prayer. Here's another verse. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. Remember what God said through Jeremiah to Judah? Your sacrifices mean nothing. Pure ritual, a cover-up for your sin. That wasn't true of David. He says, the sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. God, you will not despise a broken and humble heart it's amazing what God can do in the life of people who are truly repentant, no matter what their background. I had the privilege of visiting Angola prison. I've been there a couple of times. The first time I was there, I interviewed several prisoners. They were lifers. Three of them were murderers, rapists, but their lives had been changed. One of the guys was nicknamed Carolina. And he was number three on the FBI's most wanted list when he came to Angola. He's a lifer, which means he's a murderer. In fact, when he first came, he was like an animal. He was so mean, they locked him up for years, a couple of years. He would be uh, actually isolated from all other prisoners. Last time I was back in Angola, I had the privilege of sitting down with Carolina. I spent an hour with him showing him how to use the Life Essentials Study Bible. I gave him a copy. And at the end of our conversation, he looked at me with tears in his eyes. He said, I'm going to make a commitment to you, Gene. He said, every man in this prison that I see carrying your Life Essentials Study Bible I'm going to ask them if they know how to use it. And if they say no, I'm going to sit down and show them how. And that was exciting because at that point in time, we'd already given out 300 Bibles in the Angola prison to men whose lives had been changed but who now want to grow and mature in Jesus Christ. That, you see, is true repentance. But it's also a story of God's grace. No matter what, our background, no matter what our sin, God says, if you accept me, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all unrighteousness.